the origin of the novel, I would guess, it goes back to um, Gilgamesh, which is the or origin of literature itself. Um, but uh, last night I didn't sleep very well because I had read over the text I prepared for today, and I was horribly disappointed with how wishy-washy and vague it seemed. But today, after the other amazing talks I heard, um, I was stunned by how relevant so much of this uh, presentation is and how connected it is with everything that we've already heard in a kind of natural way that I, I'll just let it sink uh, naturally and I, I won't force the relationships. But I think in every talk today there were important connections to this talk and um, uh, yeah. So thinking about the, the uh, title I used, is from a canto three of Roussel's last work, Nouvelle Impression, uh, New Impressions of Africa. And um, it's the title of this piece of poem. The column which licked until the tongue bleeds cures jaundice. And I thought we could use this. I mean, this is evidently a kind of result of a word game that Roussel would have played to generate this kind of, this new image. Um, but it's located, of course, in the Middle East, sort of near Gilgamesh, I guess. And uh, I'd like it to stand right now as a kind of open allegory for the novel, for approaching the novel as a maker of novels or a writer, as a kind of traditional form. A uh, column is also a pun, of course. Roussel's always punning, a column of text. Could be a column of text or a sculpture or whatever. Uh, anyway, it's something that if you take it to a certain part, a certain point uh, in working and writing, not simply imitating the form and reproducing the object of the novel, but in actually writing, the act of writing a novel, it can be a painful process, uh, life-destroying, in fact, as it was to Roussel. Um, on the other hand, it can perform miracles or something that would have been called a miracle before we understood the science of it for instance, curing of jaundice, um, which brings us back to this yellow, we had a yellow pyramid, I think, in our first discussion earlier. Anyway, so I have in my theoretical writings, which are published in German by Mer Verlag, I developed a kind of fiction, half fictional, half serious theory um, of a kind of fiction, which I call the realometer. Uh, which has really sort of profound and odd reality effects. So that's sort of the, the uh, context of the following talk. Now let me find the actual first slide. Oh. Sorry, pretend you didn't see any of this. It's the memory of your future. All right, here. Um, last spring, summer, in Berlin, I saw an exhibition at the Buchholz Gallery uh, called Raymond Roussel. I believe it was just Roussel. It might have been Impressions of Roussel, but I hope not because that's a bit kitschy. But uh, it was uh, a presentation of recent materials that have come to life that have been discovered over the last 15 years about Roussel and kind of redefined who he was and et cetera. And I was extremely struck by this exhibition and um, was actually working on writing about it when the invitation to talk here came and I thought it jibed with the idea of the art novel. So um, it, it does jibe. But anyway, this was actually part of the exhibition, which is um, <coughs> very important and a strange article that nobody seems to have known about, but it was for, uh, printed in Cleveland in the Plain Dealer newspaper, uh, written by a writer named Sterling Heilig, who was an American correspondent in Paris uh, around 1910 and, and later. And uh, it was a full page spread about this character, Raymond Roussel. And it, it raises so many issues of the way I had been thinking for some time about Roussel um, that I think it's a nice introduction and gives you a sense of who he was. I'll read you, I typed out some of the text here. At the top it says, oh by the way, the two major myths that this, or ways of reading Raymond Roussel that this article helps do away with, uh, which are two main 20th century obsessions that I would like to uh, 
move away from. One is failure, the idea of failure. He was a famous failure, that is, no one li liked his work, except uh, a few surrealists um, who loved it. But uh, he was very famous for being a failure, and uh, to the point of destroying his whole fortune and committing suicide. And so a lot of 20th century writing is preoccupied by his failure, but also the idea of madness. He was a famous madman. In fact, in early psychoanalysis, he was a case study patient for Pierre Janet, one of Freud's uh, influences. And Janet wrote about his particular madness, which was self-delusion about his greatness as an author. So we want to do away with those two ideas and be like the, art, the author of this text who says, yes, he really likes to work. He's so rich, he doesn't know what to do with his money. And he's an artist on the piano. Roussel was a great uh, piano player. But he turns his hand to literature and makes sport of all Paris. Raymond Roussel is the most fortunate young millionaire of Paris. In this society of vast incomes from bonds, stocks, and real estate, his family was extremely, extremely rich. There are no, these, there are no business interests. The youth is supposed to settle down and never do these golden youth produce anything. He was classed among these golden do-nothings. His sister is married to the Duke of Elchingen, descendant of Marshal Ney. Then suddenly he threw his bomb. It was a book. Roussel is bound to go through the motions of society. Impressions of Africa, his first novel, is his revenge. Okay, so nice little introduction. And now I will start reading you um, some of this text and I will make some asides. Wow, I feel like I'm a, a rock star with these lights. Raymond Roussel, 1877 through 1933, was what I was reading on the day the invitation to speak here came. So in support of everything he represents that remains startlingly interesting 80 years after his tawdry Palermo suicide, the very stuff, as we shall see, of a Poe tale come to life, he penetrates the 21st century here as something strange and beside itself in support of everything one must in fact stand for when the question of the novel as art arises. I immediately follow chance, the arrow of the moment, most expressly when it does not hesitate to appear to exist, as is always the case with Raymond Roussel. Reading him again broadly, I must first admit I have approached him more as a journalist, an English-speaking, French-reading sort of one at that, than as a critic. I hope to return, you, return to you from Roussel with various reports of rather miraculous news items or perhaps to emerge with only another romance. Certainly, we will occupy a place where such terms are indistinguishable. But then again, who can dare to enter into anything but a tendril of Roussel without disappearing like Jules Verne's Professor Lindebrock into the caverns? To return, we may turn to any handy vein, it's a favorite word of Roussel, vein, and soon find a volcano. Indeed, pick any current outpouring of Western media today, and one is immediately struck by how so much that we have now in terms of technology, music, sound, art, and even, dare I say it, digitalia, is contained in such broadly, even outrageously satirical form as the novel, or roman, roman as Roussel conceives it, approaching Rabelais via Poe. Uh, here's an aside, and there will be many. He actually labored greatly, of course, as a poet. And he returned in the end of his life to um, this very um, complicated form of po uh, poetry, rhymed, metered poetry, uh, for his last completed work, New Impressions of Africa. Um, nevertheless, there is reason to adopt the term roman or novel, even in respect to his poetry. And this is his first major publication. It was a total disaster. He thought it would be a huge success and paid for it to be published by Le Maire, the popular printing house in, in Paris. But it was, it was, I think they sold something under 10 copies 
And um, it had this note at the beginning of, it, of the text. Ce livre est un roman. This book, being a novel, should begin at the first page and end at the last. Uh, one should begin when you're reading it. Start at the beginning and read to the end. Uh, so in this work from 19, geez, I forget. It's from 1896, I believe. Uh, he, we see Roussel taking the idea of novel in the way we've been discussing today and expanding it um, away from uh, prose. From the, This was a shorter book, La Doubleur, and uh, recreating the whole uh, concept of what a novel can be, looking at almost from the outside as a kind of artwork. Um, <clears throat> in his, his last book, new, in his, sorry, in this, his first novel, his, he tried to, for more success with this book, Impressions of Africa, in 1910, which this article we saw earlier celebrates. Uh, in that book, which is an actual prose novel, he begins with this note on the bottom that I have reproduced here. Warning, readers not initiated into the art of Raymond Roussel are advised to read the book from page 212 to page 455, and then from page 1 to 211. So uh, already, and remember, he had the money to print his own books and buy them and put them on the market himself. And already, with that capitalist power, he anticipates essentially hypertext, offering the reader two different ways to enter his text. Um, that was an aside. In the novel, oh, I read that. Here I must once again mention that the only way I could end up conceiving this talk would be as systematically resistant to any attempt at a rational essay. Uh, I devote myself to roughly anecdotal unfoldings uh, from outside Roussel. Unintentionally, but typically, this way of proceeding is one Roussel himself employs as he reaches us today through text and image. Characteristically, and perhaps peculiarly, even singularly, every anecdote or new bit of information uh, we find about Roussel seems to enjoy a one-to-one -one certain relationship with what was the old Roussel. Despite the often revolutionary and entirely revelatory discoveries we are likely to make. In, this extremely, in, in his extremely modular existence, therefore easily able to be recombined into new and possible narratives, there is of course the danger that in any current A, B line with which any history sketches out its Roussel, point B will always be that July 14th hotel room where his own revolution both began and ended with a savage self-violence that an anecdote, anecdote outdoes Sid Vicious in its incontrovertible punk rock intention and veritable status as urban myth. Fortunately, Roussel himself provided for another point B on another plane from forehead to infinity, ever sliding, never at rest, sending us a moving target that first re redefines itself on rather radical terms and proves all such points after only temporarily revelatory. With his last poem seven year, that took seven years to complete, Nouvelle Impression d'Afrique, safely in print, in 1933, Roussel left another last manuscript with his attorney, ready for posthumous publication with Le Maire, the same publishing house, uh, after his death. This posthumous autobiographical note, or series of notes, is called, it's very famous, it's called Comment j'ai écrit certain de mes livres, how I wrote certain of my books. Appearing two years after his death, just as fascism was rising in Europe, it ensured a curious um, ending and beginning of what had been the beginning of a new Roussel studies and an ending of the old ones. It was a gesture to, or as a gesture to the trickster and jokester and comic Roussel who's always with us, but actually makes no sense, um, but lives nonetheless. I remind you that this text was finally printed after he was dead on 1st April, 1935. Anyhow, uh, this is the beginning I typed up for you guys. Uh, I have the very beginning, and I notice how um, 
I'll, talk, I'll go on to talk about how in Rutel, in Roussel, there is a one-to-one -one, uh, way of language saying exactly what it means to say. So the word certain, for instance, is always very important to Roussel. He's very certain. He's the exact opposite of that 20th century idea coming through Blanchot and deconstruction of this kind of tragic gap between language and its intended meaning. For Roussel, the meaning and the language are one. And notice how clear and how perfectly expressed are the ideas by this simple text. How I wrote certain of my books. I have always been meaning to explain the way in which I came to write certain of my books. Then he names uh, the certain ones he's talking about. It involved a very special method. And it seems to me that it is my duty to reveal this method, since I have the feeling that future writers may perhaps be able to exploit it fruitfully. As a young man, I had already written stories of some length employing this method. I chose two almost identical words reminiscent of metagrams. This is the method he's describing. For example, BR and PR. To these, I added similar words capable of two meanings, thus obtaining two almost identical phrases. In the case of Biard and Piard, the two phrases I obtained were, these are translations of them, but you can imagine that in French, the two sentences sound orally exactly the same, but have completely different meanings. One, the white letters on the beautiful old billiard table. Two, the white man's letters on the booty of the old pillager. Um, he goes on then to describe more and more of these tricks, and one discovers uh, that his books, which are filled with strange and un almost unexplainable symbols and parades and images and machinery, are in fact compendiums of these word games. Uh, it was quite a shock at the time because people thought they were, that these books contained something like a Masonic secret or some kind of... Um, uh, I mean, even after this text, uh, people like André Breton still believed it had some key that Roussel's work has some secret key. Uh, with this infamous gesture, which sort of destroys the idea of his authorial intent, at the same time it creates the idea of his authorial intent, Roussel effectively revolutionized any possible current understanding of the work. But he did, did so, does so, as the rest of the text unfolds in very specific, in only specific ways. He leaves the general unsaid to us. On the one hand, he deflates the idea of his work containing um, the single signified secret message that everyone was looking for. There are those, of course, those who wonder if this isn't the best way to hide such a secret. In this process, a romantic, or what we might call today, a romantic idea of the author is annihilated by this method's reliance on the arbitrary. Um, he goes on to show to discuss in the book how these words that he's playing on came to him in daily life in extremely arbitrary fashion. So it wasn't like he tried to find uh, words that meant something to him. He just would look at this table and pick up a sentence and find one that he could work from, you know? He claims. So he worked from totally arbitrary place. Um, so what idea of the author replaces the old one of the author trying to say something um, before he begins writing. Refusing anything but the radical surface of language, uh, Roussel is, as others have proclaimed, something of a dandy in his refusal to commit to ideas around him. Yet Roussel, as the American article reminded us, is indeed also a proletarian, despite his well-known capital, interested in labor. Receiving words, concepts, puns from the world, he doubles, hides, and undoes them to unfold whatever is most alien to his own attention, which is now entirely taken up by the effort to conceal the method. Literally hammering out raw language on the steel of literature via method, arbitrarily directed, Roussel reveals something we had believed had fallen away from the printed word, something vibrantly real, like fire indistinguishable from life. I have a note there I can't read. Um, the super clarity of this beginning uh, immediately fragments in the text, by the way, into arbitrary examples and lists of notes. Um, I think I have one more. This is an example of the book, of uh, the English translation. Um, notice the first one, baleine, whale, 
um, the whale on a small island becomes uh, baleen, which is something made from a whale, on a helot, etc. And if you look at this text, it's just, um, it's, it looks almost like some kind of avant-garde poetry, etc. And it's no accident that many avant-garde poetries of the poetries of the 20th century were directly inspired by it. I'll let you read through yourself. Um, I will leave these details before you alone and glistening because honestly, and I warn you, there are places in Roussel that are difficult to escape from once we click on them. Explicitly hypnotic and filled only with the uncanny, I do ask you to note how even these descriptions here display records that perfect one-to-one -one ratio of authorial intention to content uh, one can always look for in this peculiar author. A certain idea of the author has died, yes, but this other new idea certainly remains as well. Writing begins exactly here at this dropping away of intention for Rousseau. One secret, one real secret that this book that ostensibly offers you a secret really does contain and does obscure is that the method itself, if you look closely, is no method at all. It exists in terms of he finds words that rhyme, but between these two sentences, the stories he creates, depending on more rhymes, are always arbitrary. We find in Roussel a Renaissance artisan rather than a romantic author. Um, yet we extend this idea of the Renaissance uh, artisan to a sort of human computer and printer. Beginning with simple phrases that occasion sonic puns as they occur around him in everyday life, Rousseau would launch epics of Rabelaisian scale out of the material of language itself. Um, epics that are, were remarkable, international, strange, and entirely translatable in some potential perfection. To what end? For one thing, Roussel achieved an intellectual honesty unmatched in any other text of his day, or perhaps our own. His William Wilson-like doppelganger, Proust, notwithstanding, Proust and Roussel grew up neighbors from the same social class, and in many ways, uh, they were very similar, and their writing um, has, the difference between their writing has haunted many critics. I won't even get into it. <laughs> Um, if Roussel seems at best a negative capability, it is only because we still maintain a sense of a romantic author's dramatic and possible failure to express himself. Despite his apparent extreme identification with the figure of a heroic poet, which we can find in his poetry, with the star on the forehead, the chosen one, etc., the fact is the work satires and destroys this romanticism via the invention and technology of its creation and the obscenity. We will never know um, all the levels on which his texts work. As John Ashbery has remarked, um, inc incidentally, John Ashbery also introduced into my world um, Henry Darger, who was mentioned earlier, who's also a sort of, um, I don't know, Interesting relation to Rousseau as another kind of outsider who's with central influence. Um, as John Ashbery remarked, the solemn facade of Rousseau's prose style is in fact riddled with puns, spoonerisms, and other jus de mots, which are often of an obscene nature. Like so many 20th century writers, but most certainly like Freud, also who rose today, always near, uh, Freud is always near and allied, I think, with everything that Rousseau stands for in writing. Roussel, like Freud, could not see himself as not a scientist. Once he began to understand uh, what science of his day was leading to, um, indeed, he seems to have glimpsed uh, the contemporary idea of the Enlightenment and all we can remark upon today um, with such acuity um, that it's almost bizarre. Well, I, we'll look at some examples in a minute. Um, he is the unique, in some sense, the unique technologist of language, uh, the Franklin of prose, bringing miraculous properties of that freak of reality called language into demonic, all-illuminating self-perpetuation. Um, 
Of course, the novel failed too. And so two years later, well, someone in, in conversation told him it might make a good play. So he decided to pay for his own production, hiring the best theater, the best actors, et cetera, and the directors of Paris, spending enormous amounts of money. By the way, um, he only had a sister who died quite young, and his, uh, basically he became the only sole heir of his family's fortune. So he wasn't depriving people of the money he spent. And when he spent this money, these actors were all getting paid lavishly, and he actually supported, uh, for instance, he was famous for his meals, where he would, uh, he would insist on four-hour-long meals, one four-hour-long meal every day, with enormous menus of incredibly hard and difficult uh, snacks and dishes, etc. But the chefs who worked for him became famous Parisian chefs later, and uh, the whole household that supported him ate these amazing meals. Roussel himself only tasted them. So his money... Um, was spent extravagantly, but it was spent in such a way as to, um, I think I, you understand. Anyway, here's a, here's a picture of the first production of Impressions of Africa. And I think it was in 1912, uh, one of the scenes I tried. There's not many images at this exhibition in Berlin. They had a number I had never seen before. and I tried to find one that had some uh, racial uh, elements in it, but I'm not sure what the stage was like in terms of the black characters of the novel being represented. We see here just a statue that looks somewhat uh, dark-skinned. But um, I want to draw attention to um, Roussel's um, writing about race and Africa. Critics before me have noted how the very title uh, Roussel used, Impressions of Africa, and incidentally he wrote a poem before that called Among the Blacks. Uh, as well as later he wrote Nouvelle Impression d'Afrique. Um, but critics have noted how um, Roussel, who always is punning and using uh, different meanings of every word at the same time, the title draws attention to the very blackness of the impressions of letters upon white paper. paper. Um, and the relation of the French textual enlightenment itself to, to Africa, in particular West Africa, which is where uh, the French slave, slave trade was located. Um, the book tells a story, it takes place around the uh, turn of the century, by the way, uh, after slavery in, uh, in France, is, French colonies is gone, etc. But a boat of uh, scientists and artists is sailing from Paris to uh, Buenos Aires in South America for a big exposition, and there's a storm, and they wreck on the west of Africa and get captured by a uh, an imaginary African king and held for ransom. Um, Roussel is virtually alone in the writers of uh, the French, uh, French writers of his time in such direct um, references to West Africa. Um, to quote, the, and it, it's very interesting how a book that attempts not to say anything is the only one that does, you know? Um, as C.L.R. James writes about the slave trade's relation to France, the slave trade and slavery were the basis of the French Revolution. The sad irony of history is that the fortunes created at Bordeaux by the slave trade gave to the bourgeoisie of France the very pride which needed liberty and contrib contributed to human emancipation. And it was Bonaparte, uh, that figure is always popping up in Roussel's um, Roussel's work in odd ways, who incidentally reinstituted slavery in the French West Indies. The French colonies were the first uh, and only successful slave rebellion, and it was the French Revolution, when it happened, the masses supported it. But uh, when Bonaparte took over, he needed the money from the colonies so bad, he reinstituted slavery, and it was really one of the, the greatest blows to the advancement of, of uh, Africa, etc., in the history of last 200 years, and something that's not talked about in these, it was never talked about in the days of Raymond Roussel, yet it bubbles up in his books. So Roussel, for the first and perhaps only time in French letters, um, through Roussel, one may drop metaphors and consider realistically that the very ink of the Enlightenment itself was paid for in African blood. Those letters Roussel himself paid for from his own fortune, made possible by speculation, 
Incidentally, when these guys wash up in his book on the shores of Africa, they instantly build a mini stock market. Uh, few books since Melville had so clearly called attention to the problem in history of whiteness as one inseparable from blackness. And white and black in, in the book is, um, you know, there's miscegenation and sex and the black king turns out to have had white ancestors, etc. cetera. Uh, it is enlightening that when in his last most innovative poetic work, Roussel returned to Africa, um, he did so through Egypt, of course. Um, it just is remarkable that he returned to it again. Because some people wonder, it takes place in Egypt, why his last book is called Nouvelle Impression d'Afrique at all, because it's, it seems to be less about Africa. Um, and it's odd that it's a poem, and he uses the word nouvelle also, I just realized. Okay, sorry. Um, I have often noted in my recent immersion in Roussel that his work is never racist, despite its Orientalist and Arabesque poses. Though he is said to have been a tourist who never looked outside his hotel room, he traveled the whole world and barely saw anything because he was writing so often. Um, though he did this, he was, after all, was a world traveler, like Phineas Fogg. And he knew white men were white, and he knew women were women, however they might dress. Like Shakespeare, a quiet but strong influence in all of Roussel, he saw literally endless possibilities in cross-dressing. Indeed, to describe transvestism, um, it seems that language, sorry, the description of transvestism seems to be one of the reasons language exists at all, or fiction exists at all, and it's so central to Roussel in Rousseau. Despite his advanced politics, he was nevertheless a quintessential um, and per if perverse millionaire. One anomalous oddity of Rousseau is that much of his futurism, he's very science fictional in, in some ways, um, for instance in his, his descriptions of performance, conceptual art production, uh, ready-made artworks, etc. Um, so much of this is explainable and by his wealth he was wealthy enough in 1900 to take the sort of photographs one takes today with a cell phone. And this was very striking in, in the exhibition when we saw, for the first time I saw photographs Roussel himself took. They were extraordinarily expensive, but if you had the money in the 1890s, you could take a snapshot of anything, basically. And he did that, um, anticipating uh, Steve Jobs through his own millions much earlier. Roussel maximized the aesthetic experience of reality to the point of total freedom at all hours of every day, spending his vast sums, indeed supporting many dependents and encouraging them to the heights of artisanship themselves. To prove the ultimate creativity and faceless reality of cyberspace and modern tourism as already, sorry, contemporary today tourism, as already implicitly existent in the economy of the turn of the century, Clearly anticipating internet and digital technology, he physically moved around the world in his office, um, typing every day a message that could be said to be an endless variation of the theme, inventions are not what they seem. He built this car himself, which contained his office, uh, and he literally drove through Georgia, through the Caucasus, through all of... Uh, uh, the east and into Egypt uh, and worked every day in his car. So though the internet didn't exist, it was almost indistinguishable uh, because he, he could go there from his office, you know, in the same way. Yet one believes it is this relation, it is his, his relation to money, ultimately, that allowed Roussel to serve for so many as an emblem of the mad, as one who was simply incomprehensible. The spending of his entire fortune, it was all gone by 1933, except enough to publish his last book posthumously. Uh, the spending of all this depended on an extravagance that is almost impossible to believe if you, if you read how much money he spent every day. Uh, Foucault's odd foray into Russ Roussel's studies, Death in the Labyrinth, um, came right after his history of madness and um, 
I feel it, it did a lot of destruct, destructive work to Roussel's studies and helped perpetuate the ideas of failure and madness with which are always linked to him, even though I'm talking about them now. Um, but I do would like to note that Derrida has a very interesting critique of Foucault's history of madness, or has two very interesting critiques. Um, one's called Cogito in the History of Madness. The other is called To Do Justice to Freud, um, showing that how inconsistent um, Foucault's reliance on the mad uh, being silenced by history is, considering so many of those he uses as examples of mad, Foucault, Artaud, etc., were writers. Um, Derrida quotes Foucault saying the following, and when in lightning flashes and cries, madness does reappear, as in Nerval or Artaud, Nietzsche or Roussel, it is psychology then that remains silent, speechless, before this language that borrows a meaning of its own from that tragic split, from that freedom that for contemporary man only the existence of psychologists allows him to forget. Derrida responds simply, and yet. Um, and yet, Roussel, in fact, was written about at length by psychologists in case studies. Um, and his writing was judged in those. Furthermore, as we have seen, he is anything but silenced even after death, where he's able to re-articulate his articulations. Um, and with recent discoveries of more of his lost papers, uh, this silence continues to be undermined. Um, as to that tragic split between word and, between word and signified, um, I've always already pointed out, it doesn't exist in Roussel either. In a point-by-point -point case, we are often indeed left in some fashion beholding what we can only call the sanest writer who ever lived in the capitalist world. Very importantly, Roussel was a part of the First World War, that giant mass psychosis in which he served peacefully, luckily, perhaps he paid someone to get the job, tending to the gardens at Versailles and uh, he didn't die in the trenches. But he was not, not a high officer, he was just a, you know, ordered around like everyone else. He survived um, to continue working on his entirely new sort of art. At the very same time uh, as Roussel, when people in Russia, like Melievich, were calling also for a kind of new beauty, a new kind of art. We find a sort of Bertie Worcester equipped with the mind of Jeeves, embarked, as I said at the beginning, somewhat ham-handedly, and the tradition from which Roussel writes is, is on the one hand, pure kitsch. Um, <coughs> uh, sir, Bertie Worcester, et cetera, surviving a tale written by Poe. Anomal or not surviving, I guess. Anomalous as he is, Roussel is not, we can say here, quite the original he first, it seems. On the one hand, there were humorous works of the sort uh, that influenced early, earlier literary experiments like Melville's Confidence Man, a uh, book whose hero is always unnamed and in disguise and unlocatable. There's also science fiction from, which, from out of which uh, Roussel also comes. Verne, Jules Verne, after all, employed rebuses and hieroglyphs not at all linked to the initiated realities they winked at. Um, and his narrative explained numerous machines, like Roussel. Um, uh, though Roussel's books do contain images of science fictional worlds and possibilities everywhere within them, they are, of course, rife with older sorts of anecdotes of love, lust, and the oddity of fate, principles of narrative borrowed from sources um, like, like um, the Arabian Nights and Shakespeare. There is also the sense in which his composition approaches the purely algorithmic, though in, uh, sorry, enough to be influenced by those texts still to come, authored by artificial intelligences of the future. If a new peculiarly monotonous sublime is caught in Roussel, it may be that our machine friends will one day offer us the same at their very best. It is in the implicit relation to the future his fancy of time travel illustrates that one can point out a possible source for some of the reality effects Roussel works. Um, the source, one source is Poe, I believe, who I've written on before in similar ways. Um, 
despite the algorithms and the mathematical process, there's always a human raven haunting Roussel. His work is always close to horror, whether psychological or full-on splatter gore, very much in the way of Poe, where horror is eventually indistinguishable from the very life of the writer that engenders it. Roussel shows us the anti-romantic Poe, the brutal satirist of the unconscious as it was first revealed in literature. I actually lied when I gave you the impres impression that how I wrote certain of my books was Roussel's last text. There was one other signed missive he sent to his doctor the day he left for Palermo, where he would commit suicide. Uh, it was an envelope, and the lawyer had instructions to open it immediately upon receiving report of Roussel's death. In it, there was a single note that said, I absolutely insist that a long incision is made in the vein of my wrist, so there's no risk of my being buried alive. Seems to me a reference to the premature burial by Poe. But I am told that at these times, people were really actually frightened of this more than they are today and, and would leave these instructions. Incidentally, he did die by cutting his own wrists. And he tried several times before he died. One wonders when reading, um, when reading Roussel, looking at the pictures he left and the effects, did the man really exist at all? Or is he, like Poe's first story of science fiction, himself a hoax that Poe authored? I just wanted to show you um, how similar his appearance was to Poe. And, and that was a tradition, of course. Baudelaire also tried to imitate Poe. And uh, a whole tradition of French letters was very influenced by Baudelaire's translations of Poe. And Verne, another great hero of, of Roussel, also went so far as to write his own continuations of Poe texts. He didn't copy them directly, but he basically you know, wrote sequels in, about the same, about Pym, Poe's only novel. Verne wrote a sequel to it. This is the first, uh, some people claim, the first science fiction work ever printed. It was, uh, it's called, it's some people say Frankenstein is first, okay. <laughs> but this is the first one by Poe, who kind of created the genre idea of science fiction as a popular art form, not necessarily high romantic. And um, it was on the front page of the New York Sun newspaper and presented as if it was a true story, and it's called the balloon hoax. So the first Poe science fiction story was in fact a hoax. And... Uh, Hoaxes are always part of Roussel's effort, and uh, I think it obviously influenced by Poe in that, in that way as well. It tells the story of a people crossing the Atlantic in a balloon, and it had never happened. And the day this came out in the newspaper, there was a riot in New York, I think, I think in, 30s, in the 30s, where the old New York Sun's office were. And I love that image of the printing press creating reality there. And at this moment, Poe was watching the crowds riot. And um, he said later that it was the happiest day of his life, Poe's own life, when this came out in the newspaper and there was a riot between people who thought it was true and people who didn't think it was true. And Poe said he was happiest, made happiest by those who didn't think it was true. It's just so odd, it wasn't true. And I don't know. Um, this story had reality effects. Not only would a balloon soon cross, I don't know actually, did balloons, but zeppelins would soon cross, um, but science fiction itself grew up as a healthy genre from this, and Jules Verne, et cetera, imitating. Um, and like Poe, and that's not only with Poe, I've written a whole essay about Poe's reality effects, I don't want to go into it, but like Poe, Roussel also has his own. Um, uh, in particular, in the, when we speak of an art book today, uh, we speak of a tradition of contemporary art that very directly comes out, oddly enough, from the influence of Raymond Roussel. Um, it was you know, famously Duchamp as a young man, um, fell under the spell of the plays and the writing also, and even, he even remembered later in life seeing Roussel in public playing chess at a point where Roussel decided to give up writing and just play chess. And we know that Duchamp himself later in life pretended to give up art and just study chess. And even then he was imitating Roussel. But the, the idea of the ready-made was very influenced uh, by Roussel's use of language. 
um, surrealism, Dali, et cetera, they all write about it. You, you know the history, or you should. Uh, Duchamp said he seemed very straight-laced, high-collar, dressed in black, very Avenue de Bois, uh, but he forever changed Duchamp's world, uh, both attracting him towards some of the ideas of surrealism, but also um, helped, helped influence Duchamp not to fall totally under the sway of the surrealists and go to America and find a new sort of more dandy, dandified sort of art. Um, and in the books themselves of Roussel, which are often lists of machines and artworks and strange paintings, and one, one finds um, video projection described, one finds basically every facet of art today, including things like Ed Boucher, um, very similar to, to ma machines and paintings that are in Roussel books, which will be of a gaudy sunset with the word 2 a.m. written in bright letters on it. I mean, they just seem so contemporary, these images. But interestingly, the one thing he doesn't have, though all of contemporary art seems to be contained in them today, the one thing that is not in them is the book as art idea, which is sort of odd and interesting paradox that occurred to me when I was listening to my colleagues here. Um, in regards to contemporary art, uh, Baba, I just said that. Even that curious eternal adolescence that is said to be the downfall of my own generation. I'm, a, I'm all, you know, closer to 50 than I am to 40, yet I'm still reading science fiction kids' books, you know, and authoring them. Um, but people say my generation is this kind of eternal adolescence, but they said the same about Roussel. He did um, always, he loved Verne to his last days, like, he, and he lived, he ate like a child. He was always this adolescent. He predicted the adolescence of Western culture. Um, um, I was thinking that his success with the Surrealists, um, and we heard a description of Zara, one of Zara's performances earlier when the crowd rioted during the performance. This happened customarily in every Roussel play, and there were several, and eventually the Surrealists, the young Surrealists would gather and defend the stage from the, from the outraged crowd. Um, but considering how rich he was and how willing he was to pay for advertisements of his own work, et cetera, I sometimes start to wonder if surrealism itself wasn't simply a hoax paid for by Roussel. And a lot of these earlier surrealists were very interested in money and, and fame, et cetera. You never know, but um, you do get paranoid about his money in a certain sense. And, one, and he was, you know, he loved Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty, these figures. He was sort of like that himself. Um, I don't know, that's paranoid. Today, scientists speculate on the multiverse, that great series of universes capable of containing any possible event where every possible contingency occurs. Uh, Roussel seems to show us in books what a map of such a region might look like as a whole. Breton said, he showed us everything that will be. As with Poe, who in the midst of highly sketchy intuitive science in his prose poem Eureka, nevertheless stumbles on the Big Bang Theory in the inflationary universe of today, Roussel may have stumbled himself on multiverse theory. His bizarre characters and machines and texts within texts do exist within the idea of multiverse. Um, paintings within paintings, machines upon paintings, machines, uh, paintings made by machines, etc. These uh, seem to be pro-enlightenment bids discovering whole continents of alternate realities. In such a light, his famous delusion, once believing himself to be one whose glory would rival Bonaparte and Victor Hugo, can be more rationally understood. The reality effects of literature in Roussel prove at least this. If one prints it, one can create a sort of new universe that, for more, that forever must have to contain that work within it as an essential, in his case, singularity. The authoring id in full power, language is its own other speaking to us from beyond death. I think rather it is Roussel himself speaking to us from that rare place where genius is un indeed unnecessary. In short, where the worker truly owns the means of production. And yes, he was certainly mentally ill, as he himself called it, 
not mad, but at the very same time, let us finally admit now that he was sane. Even in suicide, he exploited capital to the contemporary, employing pharmaceuticals that gave him physiological ecstasy at the same time. He anticipated today's um, pharmaceutical addicts, rich pharmaceutical addicts in his, he's, the last years of his life, he just tried every kind of drug he could find. Um, certainly if a computer from far in the future said, let me go back there after Vern and write humanity into a stage one civilization early on a bet, he might do so in the person of Raymond Roussel. But such speculations are among signs that we're dealing with something more here than an ordinary idea of literary meaning in the world. So let's remember that he approached text from outside the ordinary idea of authorship and writing, just as we do in our concept today of the art book. Um, he was despised at the time. Uh, by the way, he did not himself subscribe to the idea of an avant-garde. Uh, he wanted his work to reach only the public. And he was not interested in surrealism, uh, et cetera. Um, the students in Paris despised him. They were all starving, and here he was spending all this money on these ridiculous plays. And they called him a damned amateur. And he was an amateur. Um, he was a fan. He anticipated modern fandom as well. His hero worship of Pierre Loti and Jules Verne was almost unmatched in any fan of the Smiths or anything like that. Uh, in the one part, he really says something honest in all of his writings, or maybe it's not honest, maybe it's just a way to hide Poe. But there is this one famous um, homage to Jules Verne which is probably the saddest part. This Because he would have written this right before he committed suicide. Anyway, the end of it, uh, first he describes how he had the honor to meet Verne once and shake his hand. And then he writes, oh, incomparable master. By the way, the heroes of this are called the incomparables. Oh, incomparable master, may you be blessed for the sublime hours which I have spent endlessly reading and rereading your works throughout my life. I do think this is the saddest thing I have read in Rousseau, a point of only loss, as if the exemplary revolutionary denouement of Verne's mysterious island had been Americanized into the Wizard of Oz, which it actually was, by the way. This idea at the end of the Wizard of Oz where you realize the wizard is a man controlling everything is basically an imitation of the Verne's mysterious island where a similar thing happens. Except in Verne, it's, it's Captain Nemo, who turns out not to be Captain Nemo as we imagine, but an Indian from India who hates colonialism. Um, but in Roussel, it's as if Dorothy discovers the nature of the wizard, uh, but refuses to give up her first illusion of his vast power. Um, just as, how am I doing on time here? Okay, just as all of Roussel's writing celebrates a radical perfection of certainty, where everything is always eventually perfectly rendered, explained, and embodied, or in flux between a total fusion of cause and intent, so his life and career, a sort of dandy martyrdom, um, the total refusing of all received language but his own, only rendered him alienation. This is one message his life and work does express to the art writer who hopes to write a novel, uh, taking us back to this idea of um, licking the column till your tongue bleeds. The pain of writing and uh, the work and the labor is something he did not shy from despite his millions. A recent article by the American science philosopher, I, I don't know if that's what he is, but Daniel Dennett, you may have heard of him. Um, the article is called, it's in Atlantic, I think you can get it online, just came out. It's called A Perfect and Beautiful Machine, What Darwin's Theory of Evolution Reveals About Art Artificial Intelligence. Uh, the article argues that we think that artificial intelligence is some mysterious thing that's impossible to create, but Dennett argues that we ourselves are artificial intelligence. He shows that the first computers uh, were 
not the first, but in the 20th century, there were computers, and they were called that, where women working in offices who just simply did number editing all day long. Uh, the first copyists were, or not first, but the 19th century copyists like Bartleby were Xerox machines doing this. Today, we have uh, interpreters who sometimes interpret our words as we speak, but one day, they themselves might be artificial machines. Um, if Dennett is correct, interpreting 19th century science uh, to the point that human consciousness is only, the mere con is only mere competence of a meat computer with language for its code, he only looks at the surface, the beginning surface of the seas that Roussel himself explored, quite like a hero in Verne on his infinite voyages. But the letters Roussel leaves in plain sight but doubtless not yet discovered, like those of the minister D in Poe's tale of ratiocination, the purloined letter. We heard the word purloined earlier. When one reflects that Roussel was himself the victim of blackmail, we must begin to wonder if the brain itself, if his brain itself was in fact only one possible manifestation of a piece of code of any given literary moment as printed by Mr. Poe. I don't know what the hell that sentence just In face of such extravagance, let us take, then take for an ending uh, the most important letter, the one so explicitly addressed to we writers of the future. Um, did, somewhere back here I had this. Ah, this last letter in, in how I wrote certain of my books. Uh, I want to point out that he says, it seems to me that it is my duty to reveal this method since I have the feeling that future writers may be able to exploit it fruitfully. Of course, future writers did, in particular, uh, Ulipo, the Ulipo group, who was also mentioned earlier, Perec and others, Harry Matthews, and uh, Calvino, and these people used Roussel's methods uh, uh, to inspire methods of their own and create their own literature. The Nouvelle Roman, uh, is that pronounced correctly? The uh, you know Robe Grier style books were also directly came out of Rousseau. The New York School of Poetry through John Ashbery's obsessive translation and love of Rousseau, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And today, us as art writers, uh, we can we can get outside of language, as we've seen examples all day long. Uh, uh, we can just by simple attention, we can divorce ourselves from the ordinary idea of authorial int intent, and we can, uh, et cetera, enter the same seas and that Roussel did. Um, remember, he seems to tell us, our first principles are corrupt at best. The situation, our situation is as embarrassing as anyone else in our family. But if you have the best intentions uh, with regard to your method, and to your subject, if you truly attempt to strain all subjectivity away, literature, that spawn of the only observed phenomenology able to link cause and effect invisibly and without objective, objective transfer of energy, that's true, by the way, is that language is the only thing that can cause and effect without uh, actual things touching each other that has been observed yet in the world, except maybe gravity. Uh, Literature, if hollowed out enough, can sustain us on our trip down the maelstrom. With everything against the possibilities of his self-expression, including physical and economical uh, reality and all the temptations of Christ himself, nevertheless, literature and the novel did allow Roussel, um, after all, a way into his real predicament. With only bits and pieces of the outside taken in, he focused inward and saw the whole universe. And uh, I want to show you this, yes. And contained it oddly intact in books. I just want to show you these, these this is, incidentally, that's from Jules Verne's uh, Mysterious Island I was talking about earlier. Verne used these strange symbolic maps. Um, these are some images that were in uh, Roussel's last published book, Nouvelle Impressions of Africa. He worked seven years on this very difficult poem. If you know it, it's, all, it's very difficult to read. Um, we saw a bit of it at the 
this, this is a bit of it. Um, you see these parentheses. The whole poem goes parentheses into parentheses into parentheses. So you never, until the end of the, can, the canto, is when you get the end of the first sentence. And you can never, it's very, it's very experimental and strange text. But it was, he worked seven years on this and he had very high hopes for it also. Uh, but when he printed, when he was getting ready to print it, it only was about 50 pages long and he wanted it to really be thick. So he decided to have, he did several things. He published each page only on one side, so it doubled the length. And then he added these pictures, which are supposed to be illustrations to the text, um, but they were all printed together in a row at the end. And he did it by hiring a private detective to approach a famous illustrator who he paid. And the detective simply gave him these lines that you see written at the bottom. And then the illustrator, not knowing where this was going or for whom it was being drawn, drew these now famous drawings. I think there are 22 of them or something. Um, and they have almost, remember the book is about Africa and almost all the pictures are of Paris. They have nothing to really do with the text. It's quite odd and quite, and was quite inspirational to Max Ernst, to artists ever after until our own day and really predicts conceptual arts use of language uh, in a very haunting way. Um, but I wanted to point you to the one on the right, the man, the illustration. It says, a man seated at a table on which lies an upright book, two uncut pages of which he pries apart to read a passage. Um, Roussel also anticipated the art book itself and its use of printing techniques here because he had the illustrations printed on the inside of the pages that were still stuck together in the, in the novel. So it was very beautifully done. So you had to cut each page to look at the picture. And then in the book, he had a picture of a man looking at text, not images, sort of reversing it. This kind of games he was up to and no one knows why. But on the last page of the book, he has this wonderful image. Um, on the left, it says, a section of starry sky viewed from sidereal space to create an impression of infinity. That would be the last page of his last published, uh, well, not his very last, but his, while he was alive. And it just so oddly, uh, the artist, who was actually a famous popular artist of his day, Zo. Uh, almost recreated perfectly what is now, some people claim, the most important uh, photograph ever taken by humans, the Hubble Deep Field, where every one of these dots you see on the right is a, a galaxy as big as the Milky Way, um, and was the first time humanity really had a visual sense of the vastness, of infinite vastness of space. It just seems so oddly uh, chiming, and this kind of reality effect I'm talking about. So, I just want to, as a last thing, let's read some lines of uh, together, where um, I just want you to have this sense of how funny Roussel is, despite all of this sort of serious things we've been saying. The column which licked until the tongue bleeds cures jaundice. Uh, this is an imaginary mosque on the outskirts of Demetium. What a heroic treatment this, consuming with one's tongue, which is not to be sheathed until some blood from it is wrung, after a thousand other idiots, this pillar's sides. That's how we can approach uh, writing a novel, I think. Um, you know, it's mock heroic. Uh, the novel may have began in the modern sense with Don Quixote we were talking about last night, which is, has a tradition of mock hero heroicism. And I think we've seen that tradition today in some of our other talks. Always humor mixed in with what a novel can be um, in artistic practice. And uh, yeah, by the way, uh, the sentence does end 500 uh, lines later. He says, uh, but why not bend the knee or chase with rapid strides under the spell of hope that is palpable or chimerical? It will end very hundreds of lines later uh, to bring about inside oneself the secession of an ill. All right, I'll stop there.